to introduce this, I'd like to tell you that uh, the Old Testament called people to be in relationship with God. But the New Testament called people to be in union with Christ. Now, to emphasize that, I want to, I want to tell you that the early church never used re personal relationship with God. <laughs> There's, I look at the documentation, nobody ever talk about personal relationship with God, but they all talk about union with the body of Christ. The other thing is uh, they had no prayer to receive Christ. That's unheard of in the early church. Nobody prayed to receive Christ in the early church. Because when you want to get converted, you get baptized. You have to be immersed in water. Now let's, let's look at the scriptural passages that talk about union and then uh, the objective here is uh, we are going to discuss the differences in the terminology and the meaning because that's the one that clouds our understanding of what the new testament really means um, it doesn't mean to say that relationship is wrong it doesn't mean to say that praying to receive christ is wrong it simply means that there is a big gap between the understanding of the early church of how to be in relationship with Christ and how to actually make him your savior and Lord. Then we will also discuss which, which terminology actually reflects God's call to holiness better. And then uh, we will talk about how we can apply this principle because that is important. Once we learn uh, once we learn these principles here, we need to uh, we need to learn how to apply. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the if you look at the implications of union with Christ, that's what we're going to discuss. Union with Christ was already um, illustrated and covered by the ritual of baptism. Union with Christ again is illustrated and covered by the celebration of the Eucharist, which we just did. And Pastor Oni explained it briefly. But then we, we want to talk about the implications of that union. So let's, let's start with baptism. In John 3, 5, Christ said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So now Christ is saying something here is mandatory. If you don't do this, you're out. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, the early church was unanimous in understanding that born of water actually refers to water baptism. They actually believed that when Christ was baptized by John the Baptist, he transformed the meaning of baptism because it was at that point that not only was he baptized with water, but the Holy, Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. It's the first ever experience in John's baptism that the Holy Spirit was involved. So, and this is way, way after Christ's baptism, he's now saying, unless one is born of water, that means water baptism, and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now let's look at the, um, what Paul says about baptism. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism, right? In order ju that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him in death, like his, we shall certainly be united with him in resurrection like his. So Paul, Paul continues to use the word united. And many of us, because our paradigm, our, the way we think about baptism is still from the Protestant Reformed view, we don't see united. You know, we read it, but we don't see it. But now that we're talking about it, how many times does he mention it? It's over and over, but we don't see it. Okay? So what does that mean now? We will, we will know the meaning of united with Christ, I think, when we go into the Eucharist. So here we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, right? Paul said in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, 
And the life I live, I live by faith in, in the Son of God who gave himself for me. So union with Christ means you are united with him in his death. You have, you're united with him in his death. You are reunited with him in his burial. And then you are reunited with him in his resurrection. So when you, when you say united in death, in the same way Christ died, our old self has to die. In the same way that Christ was buried, our old self has to be buried. Because only when that happens, then we, when, in the same way that Christ rose from the dead, we also rise in newness of life. And that's the words, that's the words of Paul, right? And that is what born again is all about. You have a new life. This one comes from the uh, Orthodox Study Bible. I read it and it's, it's spot on, right? What is baptism? Simply put, baptism is our death burial, and resurrection in union with Jesus Christ. It is a rite of passage given by Christ to the church as an entrance into the kingdom of God and eternal life. So water baptism is our entrance into the kingdom and into eternal life. Why? Because Christ said, remember, unless one is born of water, unless one is born of water, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And this is how the early church understood it unanimously. No one differed in their understanding. In the new covenant, baptism is the means by which we enter the kingdom of God, are joined to Christ, and are granted remission of sins, the Holy Spirit. The results of baptism is our first and second dying. Our first dying with Christ in baptism was our death with him on the cross. Okay, this is, this is one of the um, church bishops. Whenever he baptizes, he instructs his new converts. You were led by the hand to the holy pool of divine baptism. And each of you was asked if he believed in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. And you made that saving confession. You descended into the water and came up again three times. They, they immersed three times. Once in the name of the Father, then of the Son. Then in the same moment, you died and were born. Okay. Then there's the second death of baptism. It's a continual dying to sin daily. Right. Remember what Christ said? If anyone come after me or follow me, let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me. And then here in the resurrection of righteousness, a while ago it was death, now it's resurrection. It is our being joined to Christ in his glorified humanity and indwelt by God himself, of course, through the Holy Spirit. And then third, these are what happens after baptism. An intimate and continual communion with God. We are raised to new life for a purpose, union and communion with God. In this sense, baptism is the beginning of eternal life. Now let's look at the Eucharist. Paul said, and when Christ had given thanks, if you look at given thanks from the Greek, you see this word, it's uh, Eucharistisas, Eucharistisas. And that's where we got the, the, the term Eucharist. So basically the the celebration of the Eucharist is really an act of thanksgiving by the early church. And in the act of thanksgiving, let's see what happens. <clears throat> We've seen all of this in Matthew and in Mark. Uh, Christ said, you know, in the Lord's Supper, he said, take it, this is my body. And then for the wine, this is my blood, right? This is my blood, right? In Mark, it's the same thing. I think it's said differently. This is my body. And then uh, he took the cup. This is my blood. So it's the same thing in Mark. In Luke, let's look at Luke. This is my body. That's the bread. And then the cup, this cup is poured out for you. Is the new covenant in my blood. Luke says it a different way. But curiously, the, the record of the Last Supper is not in the book of John. Instead, why? Because 
the three Gospels are really narratives of what happened to Christ. But John himself was not interested in that. He was interested in the meaning, the meaning of why Christ came here as the Son of God. So he looks at this differently. Now, what I want you to know is this. The church had been practicing the Eucharist for a long time before the Gospel of John was written by John. So when John wrote his gospel, the church already knew this. So he was putting the meaning into it. And what did John wrote? John 6, 53. And again, you know this. Truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. Here, he uses the word abide here, right? That means he is going towards union with Christ, but he's using the word abide. I live because of the Father. He also will live because of me. John now explains the meaning of the Eucharist. And he's saying it's basically eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Christ. But what is the word picture here? The word picture here is in, in primitive language is even when they have a peace compact, right? When I drink somebody's blood, he is in me. I am united to him, right? But Christ, all, of course, used also eat, eat my flesh. And but because he was in this chapter, he was referring to the manna from heaven, that he was the bread of life. Okay, so. He was saying both, and then he said this long before he initiated the Last Supper, right? But of course, the Jews were already ce celebrating the Pascha, right? Which also involves wine and, and uh, matzah. Now, again, remember he used the word abide. When you feed on my flesh and drink in my blood, what do you remember with abide? John 15, right? The vine and the branches. So I am the true vine. Abide in me as I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, John is giving a, another picture of union with Christ. Union is abiding, constantly getting connected, constantly attached. To Christ. So now you have two word pictures. Union is where two bodies merge. Abiding is where two bodies are always connected. So those are the word pictures now that we're getting from the New Testament and from the Gospels, right? Okay, do you remember this verse in uh, Corinthians 11? Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be gu guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself, right? And he, he is saying here, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died because they partook of the Eucharist in an unworthy manner. Now, this completely contradicts or dispels the Protestant notion that the bread and the wine are simply symbols. How can they be symbols when they actually affect you physically. So now let's look at history. And then the Orthodox study Bible again was, is, is very clear here. For the first thousand years of Christian history, when the church was visibly one and undivided, because the Roman Catholic and the Greek Orthodox separated in 1000 AD. So 1000 years, they were united. All believed unanimously the holy gifts of the body and blood of Christ were received as just that, his body and blood. Okay, now you'll see history here. The church confessed this was a mystery. The bread is truly his body. That which is in the cup is truly his blood. But one cannot say how they become so. You know, this attitude says that, and, and this is what Pastor Oni said, we, we know this by faith. Right? Because by sight, it's simply bread. It's just wine. But by faith, 
it is the blood and body of Christ. Okay? Now, what happened after that, the age of reason came to the West. These are the rationalists. So they began to question the Roman Catholic Church. How can the blood become, how can the wine become blood? And how can the bread become the body of Christ? And the Roman Catholic answer was transubstantiation. That means they are miraculously converted into the blood and body of Christ. Now, the, this second view was unknown in the ancient church. So that means the Roman Catholic Church invented the concept of transubstantiation. Like, it's like magic, right? When the reformers came out in the 16th century, they were definitely against transubstantiation. But they swung to the extreme and said that it's just a symbol. And look at, look at their comment. This third symbol only view helps explain the infrequency with which some Protestants partake of the Eucharist. Why? Because the, the early church always did it on the first day of the week. That means every Sunday in our calendar. But because we inherited the concept that it's just a symbol, then it became optional. So, But since Christ commanded it, we do it at least once a month. And uh, some people just once a year or during Christmas or Easter because of the concept that it's just a symbol. But then, uh, like I said, uh, how can it be a symbol when you drink unworthily, you get sick or you die? Having said that, this concept of union with Christ is really a key concept in the early church. They did not just talk about having a personal relationship with God. And remember, even your concept of personal relationship would be different from mine. But I think we would agree, we would, our concepts would be closer if we use the terminology union with the blood and body of Christ. We are the blood and body of Christ. And why is that, why is that more, uh, more precise? Because we are supposed to grow into Christ-likeness. Here Paul is now explaining the concept of union with the body of Christ and how it applies. In, this is Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay, he starts with a gen general thing. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, which means God forgets the past, right? But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Now, this is the important thing that we have to look for here. Who will not inherit the kingdom of God? We see big sins, right? But how about this? Just being greedy, just being a drunkard, just being a reviler or just cheating your neighbor, right? You cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, right? Now, this one is from Corinthians 6, 12 to 20. This is a continuation. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Yeah. Food is meant for the stomach. The stomach meant for food. God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now here it is, 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Now this is another angle on union with Christ, right? Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So there's no other way to interpret this, but to assume that when you enter the kingdom, you are in union with the body of Christ. Shall I then, this is the application, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? 
but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Right? And here, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God? And then it ends with, you are not your own, but you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So this conclusion now tells us that union with Christ in his body makes us owned by Christ. And we can only perform things that Christ would do. And remember the slogan, what would Jesus do? There is some truth to that. I mean, there's a lot of truth to that, except that they don't know where that application came from. What is the base principle? Now look at, look at uh, Peter's take on this. He said, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own excellence, by which he has granted to us his pre precious and great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Right? So being a partaker of the divine nature is a result of Christ be, us being bought with a price and therefore we are un, in un, united with Christ but we don't own Christ. Instead, Christ owns us. Okay? And then finally, this is the uh, theme of growing into Christ-likeness. John the Baptist said this, Christ must increase, but I must decrease. This is a good springboard for discussion. Relationship versus union. What, what difference do you see now between the terminologies? Because today we talk about, you know, we invite people to have a personal relationship with God. But they don't understand the meaning until you talk about what the early church talked about. When you're in union with Christ, you have to no choice but to be Christ-like, right? This is actually new to me also, as it is new to you. And, you know, it, it, it basically convicts me of a lot of things. Because when we, when we fail the Lord, because of something we do or don't do, then we fail the principle of uh, being united with Christ, being in union with the blood and body of Christ. And the other thing is, I would like us to remember every time we perform the Eucharist or celebrate, not perform, celebrate the Eucharist, that it is an affirmation. Every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, it is an affirmation that we continue to desire and maintain union with Christ.